Okay, tonight what we're going to be talking about, this might be kind of unbelievable to you, but I think it's kind of important that I discuss this. So this might be shocking to you. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 11, please. Daniel chapter 11. Y'all quiet, pretending like <laughs> you don't know, all right? Pretending like you don't know. So, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just keep yourself innocent if you're actually serious. But this has been a very... This has been a big, popular uh, television show throughout uh, the whole world, I guess, pretty much. Now, you know your pastor is that he's not a big TV fan. But what I do... Yeah, praise the Lord for that one. But what I do is that I do keep tabs on care, uh, current events and popular culture. And whenever I see some trend going on, then what I would do is I would research it. So this kind of teaching that I'm giving to you tonight is I'm going to give you from... What I've researched right here, and I believe that if you want a successful blockbuster hit or television show, is anything that can contribute to Satan even more. That's right. So I heard that there's a very popular TV show, for example, Lucifer, that's been like yeah. very popular. So that one's a no-brainer that Christians should not be watching that something heretical like that. A book, Harry Potter. That's closest to a cult that you can get, uh -huh. but that's been very famous. And Rowling, she made over a billion dollars. I, th she, I think she, uh, well, I, it's the total net income was like a billion or something, I think. I could be wrong about that. But she made a killing of a money. She made a killing of a money through that one. But Game of Thrones, I also believe, contributes to this. Now, in every Hollywood theme, what do you think that they borrow it from? They borrow it from the Bible. The Bible's always way ahead of them. So before Hollywood catches up, and they take certain elements or themes from the Bible, then they'll use that for the devil's glory right here. Now, I'm going to show you something that's pretty interesting that Satan has unconsciously put upon TV viewers. TV is the most successful brainwashing tool where people can watch something and then they'll unconsciously remember it. Yeah. So that when they go through real life situations, they can be immune to it or they can follow the theme and the element of what they watch without realizing it, without realizing it. Now the first thing to understand is this, is that what, what does Jesus have to do with Game of Thrones? So that's the title today. What does Jesus have to do with Game of Thrones? Well, first thing is this, is that one, Christians should not be watching that. Amen. Now, you might say, why is that, Pastor? It's a very simple thing you have to ask yourself. Can you honestly say with all the nudity and the violence and certain themes like dragons stereotyped as something good over there, can you honestly say when watching those things before you watch it, Lord, I'm going to watch this to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then watch it. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? Whatsoever you do, do all things to what? The glory of God. That's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay, so I don't have to explain why that's not a Christian thing. <laughs> Another thing is this, is that there are now Christian organizations who's taking Game of Thrones elements and trying to mingle that with the Bible rather than realizing that Game of Thrones was stealing elements from the Bible and mingling with it. But rather Christians going the other way around by compromising with Game of Thrones to use that to popularize with the younger generation. Now you will not believe which preacher took a Game of Thrones theme to do his Bible study. You know who it was, you wouldn't believe it. John Hagee. Wow. John Hagee. And he's one of the most conservative uh, Christian types you'll ever meet who's very close to an independent Baptist. Now, believe it or not, uh, well, I'm not going to actually mention this, but John Hagee taught some doctrines that only Bible-believing pastors would teach, too, believe it or not. So John, because John Hagee, he's at the Texas area, and there's a lot of our own crowd Bible-believing pastors who stand in the gap at Texas, and I wouldn't be surprised that their teachings have impressed big shot pastors there later on. But anyway, aside from that, John Hagee, he would take all these colors, these themes, and this music from Game of Thrones and use it for his preaching and teaching. Now that is one of the worst things you can ever do. 
There are Christian tracks that take Star Wars themes while they pass it out to kids. And I get, promise you this, I bet you there's a Game of Thrones Christian track out there. Nothing will surprise me nowadays. Okay, so that's what Jesus have to do with Game of Thrones is have nothing to do with it. But I'll tell you a lot, a lot of other things where they steal from the Bible what Jesus will have to do with Game of Thrones. The first thing is this, which is pretty interesting. The first thing that you'll realize is in Daniel chapter 11, notice, let's talk about the Antichrist right here. Verse 21, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Verse 23, and after the league made with him. So there's no doubt this is the Antichrist. Now, here's the thing, though. Do you know what this Antichrist, this king, is called when you look up backwards through your Bible? You go backwards at verse 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. Talking about the same king. Notice who he's called. King of the North. Now, here's the thing is that Hollywood... Their favorite hero is the one who's called King of the North. And supposedly this King of the North, he's the fa favorite hero in Game of Thrones, and they want him to rule the seven kingdoms. They want him what they call, they have a big throne over there that accumulates all the kingdoms. They're waiting for that king to come down and rule over everything. King of the North. Now, you know who the king of the north is? That's the Antichrist. That's right. Now, do you know who will be more, very receptive to the Antichrist? It's the younger generations. Yep. So when this older generation dies out, this younger generation, they're going to think it's a cool thing that this king of the north will be coming in. And yeah, they're going to say, man, I watch Game of Thrones. This is really cool. I mean, this guy is, this is like real life situation right here. See? Imagine. As every generation dies out and legends and stories like Star Wars, it's became a theme now through generation to generation. If this thing carries on, what do you think people will do? Mm -hmm. I'm going to accept this Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you'll notice about this king of the north. Here's another one. Let's also look at the book of Psalms chapter 2. Psalms chapter 2. Another thing concerning about Game of Thrones right here is that so what they're all fighting for is that there's a bunch of kings or there's a bunch of people who want to inherit this throne. And this big throne over here, I think it consists of a throne of swords. And then Obama, they had a play where they actually made the same, which is pretty interesting. They gave the same kind of uh, throne to Obama at his White House. I don't know if you noticed that. So they did that because... It was like a cool thing. Now, there's a lot of speculation about Obama being the Antichrist. And then isn't it interesting that he would be sitting on a throne like this, you know? Now, I'm not saying that he is the Antichrist, but I find that still very interesting. That Obama had this kind of throne for him. So all these kings are fighting for this throne. Many different kings. And many different people who are trying to fight for this. Kings and people are trying to fight for this throne. So while they're all battling and fighting each other, trying to get this throne, here's the thing, is that Jesus Christ said, I'm going to be the one who will crush all these kings and people. I'm going to be the one who will crush all of them and take this throne for myself. Now the thing is this, though, is that what's so interesting is that in Game of Thrones you'll see these people saying the same thing I'm gonna crush all these people I'm gonna tackle all of them I'm going to get crush all these people and sit on this throne but that matches with Jesus Christ you know what this throne is called in Game of Thrones the Iron Throne you know what Jesus Christ will do he says he's gonna crush all these kings and people and rule them with the rod of iron Wow Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his who? Anointed, that's Jesus Christ, saying, 
Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. See that? All these people saying, we're, gonna, we're going to break all these kings and these people. We're going to break all of this and then sit on the throne that will rule over the world. This iron throne. Because look at verse 9. Jesus Christ, he's going to break them, right? Verse 9, thou shalt break them with a what? Rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. How about that? But the Antichrist would love to be that king of the north who will claim the iron throne for himself. See what Satan is always doing? He always wants to steal some glory from God Almighty. He's always that type of person. Blessed in Jesus' name, Lord, while I watch this show and you're getting all this unconscious, uh, all these garbage in your unconscious mind and you have no idea that you're just rooting for the protagonist here to sit this. Okay, here's another thing right here. Let's go to Zechariah, please, the book of Zechariah. Here's something else that's very interesting concerning my research on Game of Thrones. Is that when I researched about, okay, so then where is this iron throne located then? Because I think that Satan, he obviously would want the location for himself as well. Mm -hmm. That's why Jerusalem has always been a hot spot. Satan always tried to claim territory over there. That's right. The three main religions are already over there, folks, that the Antichrist has set up. The Muslims are there, the Jews are there, and the Catholics are there. Those are his three main religions. They're already all over there in Israel they're already all over there at Jerusalem. But what's very interesting is that, you know what this place is also located, this Iron Throne? It's located in a place called King's Landing. Now, here's the thing right here. No, Jesus Christ, you know what he's going to do? When he lands at his throne, the Bible says that he's going to uh, land the king will literally land and split the mountain in half and claim that throne for himself. Amen. See what Satan wants to do? He wants to claim himself as a, as a king who will land and take over the main capital and city of the throne that will rule over all the world. That's what Game of Thrones teaches and shows. Yep. And in the Bible, that's the city of Jerusalem. He don't want Jesus Christ to land as king. <laughs> he wants himself to claim it. Look at the book of Zechariah. Whoa, 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 right? That's very true. Look at the book of Zechariah, and then we'll look at chapter 14. Chapter 14. Look at verse 9. Zechariah chapter 14. And then we'll read verse 9. Notice right here, And the Lord shall be what? King over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord. But... When he rules as king, when is that going to happen? When he lands his foot down. Verse 4. And his feet shall what? Stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Look at that. See? The king, when he lands, he splits it in half. You know where a king's landing is? That's Mount of Olives right up there at the tippy top. Yep. That's King's Landing. But Satan, he wants it for himself. And we're all rooting for this protagonist, the King of the North, which is, ooh, the Antichrist, to come and take over. Mm -mm, my, my, my. Here's another thing right here which is pretty interesting. We're also going to look at Revelation chapter 13, please. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Okay, so who is actually the good guy here in the Game of Thrones that everyone's rooting for and everybody thinks it's a good guy and it's really cool? Dragons. Dragons. So I don't know. I don't know much about these characters. I think the main character that a lot of girls are liking is called... Uh, Daenerys Tungarian or something like that. Daenerys Tungarian. So we see right here that 
So we see I can't even spell that name. So we'll just call her DT, shall we? <laughs> DT, so I can't spell that name. But this is a character where she wants the Iron Throne for herself. And everyone just loves this character, actually. Everyone loves this character, and everyone loves the dragons. And these characters, they're actually unstoppable. It's as if they can burn up everything across their path and get the Iron Throne for themselves. And everyone's rooting for this person to get the throne. But who is the one who will rule in the tribulation, claiming God's city for himself? The dragon, Satan. Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 4. This is at the tribulation, folks, at Jerusalem. And they worship the who? Dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's right. No one can. See? Because why? This is the power. Can I tell you something else that's pretty interesting about this? Do you know how many dragons she has? She has three dragons. You know who will rule the world with power during that time? The satanic trinity of Satan. Who are they? Satan, the Antichrist, or a.k.a. the beast, and the false prophet. That's right. You need three devils. You need three dragons, so to speak, to rule over the world in power. My, my, my. How about that? Okay, so let's also look at the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 24. The book of Matthew chapter 24. Isn't this something where the, the devil is using all this stuff to brainwash the younger generation? Yeah. Just waiting for the older generation to die out. And then once the younger generation comes in, they're going to think this is cool right here. You know what's very interesting as well? Is that in the show... There is a marriage or there is a relationship between this character and this character. These two demonic characters right here. But guess what? The, you saw Revelation chapter 13. The dragon gave his power to the who? The beast, the Antichrist. And this character, king of the north, he has some bloodline with the dragons. Gets some power from them. How about that? Wow. Wow, isn't this something that Satan would, would love for kids to watch and for them to get brainwashed in so that when he comes down, they're going to think, man, this is like Game of Thrones, dude. Uh -huh. This is so cool. This is so cool. So that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. All right, so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 24, please. Matthew chapter 24. Now, this is very interesting. Now, I don't know if this is really true. From what I researched, I don't think this is really true. But this is one thing I noticed about this area. So there's a location where this, where it's, uh, well, let me get back over here. So in, when winter season was coming during that time, in this location right here, King's Landing, it seems like there's no winter over there. It's always some kind of spring or summer season right over there. That's what it always shows. It doesn't show snow. It doesn't show any kind of cold or winter. It's like a beautiful blossoming area in this capital of kings. You know what the Bible says? That the capital where Jesus Christ will rule over all the world when he comes down is likened to? It is likened to the blossoms that are going to bloom during this time of the season. Israel. Matthew chapter 24 verse 32. Notice that the Bible says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that what? Summer is nigh. Now as you keep reading right here, notice that it also reads, So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Look at that. So Jesus Christ's coming is so close that it's even at the door, so to speak. So when he, when Jesus Christ comes down and Israel is at the end times, the season is during that spring and summer season. But this is likened to the nation of Israel. Their capital is this kind of season right here. So that's also interesting from the movie. So now what is interesting is concerning about the evil person now. So the evil person, he is known to be as a ruler over the snow and over winter. Now, this is where it gets really interesting right here. Turn to the book of Job, please. Turn to the book of Job. Apparently, this creature or this character is such an evil and such a powerful being, such a powerful and evil being, that 
No one can stop him, not even the dragons. Okay, pay attention. This is where I'm going to get to, which is going to get really interesting. This king, who is known as the Night King, and who has the power of winter and the snow, he's conquering all these kings like unstoppable, like it's Armageddon, like it's unstoppable. And no one can stop him. Even these dragons that everyone's rooting for, when the dragons try to overpower this night king or this winter, they even fall weak to this powerful king. Now, when you look up in your Bible concerning about winter and snow, what is very interesting is this. The power that is connected to that in the Bible is mainly God Almighty. It's not the devil, it's God Almighty. That's what you're going to find out, which is very interesting. Now, demonic creatures, they do have some access to something frozen and watery. I've taught that before, which is interesting. But look up every verse in the Bible that mentions snow and winter and etc. The verses are going to show you that it has to do with God. It has to do with God. So look at Job chapter 38, please. Job chapter 38. And look what the Bible says about this. So, this night king, this king of the power of the snow and the cold, who is unstoppable and can conquer dragons, they're putting that as Jesus Christ right here, making him an evil person. And when this king falls, everyone's rejoicing. Yay! Yay, this is awesome. I actually saw YouTube videos where there are clips where this night king is defeated and everyone's like so psyched up. They're like, oh my goodness! Oh, oh! Like, like it's like an insane thing. It's like a football game to them. Someone, like their team won the Super Bowl. Now, this is something that's pretty disturbing to me right here then, is that they're trying, that you see this king of winter, this powerful person, is connected with God in the Bible, and that what's very interesting is this too. His army falls when this king of winter dies. You have to kill this character, this night king. Then you can conquer all the other people, all of his armies. If you don't conquer this guy, you can't conquer all of his army. Satan knows this. If this king dies and falls, the Lord Jesus Christ, he can conquer everybody. Hmm. But let's look at Job chapter 38. Who's speaking? Then the Lord answered who? Job, out of the whirlwind. Correct? Now God's saying in verse 5, who hath laid the me measures thereof, if thou knowest. So God is saying, who's the one creating all of this? So it's a rhetorical question. It's obviously referring to himself. But now look at this as you keep reading down. Notice that what God says in verse 26, for to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness when there is no man. Notice also verse 22, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which what? I have reserved against the what? Time of trouble against the what? Day of battle, Day of battle and war. Isn't that interesting? Oh my goodness. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. God was way ahead of you. <laughs> you want me to tell you something even more wild than that? You know what the famous catchphrase is I noticed in Game of Thrones? It's a famous catchphrase that you've heard. Three words. It's called winter is coming. Now, this is like a doomsday prediction. Aha! Who is winter coming from in, according to the book of Job? Oh my goodness. I just watched. Oh my goodness. You just watched all, uh, I don't know, 10 seasons of Game of Thrones or something like that. I don't know, eight, five, six, I don't know. But you just watched all of Game of Thrones just now, brother. But you see right here, we're all saying Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Repent, get right with God. That's right. But Satan, he's putting this in the television. Winter is coming. Uh -huh. And he wants you to make it like this is an evil person that's coming uh -huh. rather than a positive person. Oh, I forgot one more interesting thing. You know what the Night King's army is? The dead. You know what Jesus Christ's army is when he comes down with his army and conquers the world? It's the dead in Christ that rise first. Wow. Isn't that interesting?